That's a pretty sobering number to start with. 50% of those devices being used by people who aren't actually supposed to be using them at home. Uh, our next, is, uh, next part of the program is going to be a panel, and uh, my panelists are all waiting outside, ready to come in as well. So I'm going to invite them in to take their seats as well on stage while I introduce them. Uh, our next panel will be talking about how, if you, well, can you hack it, moving beyond prevention to proactive defense. Uh, please welcome Murari Kalyana Ramani, who is the Chief Information Security Officer at UOB Singapore. BG Gaurav Kirti, who is Deputy CE, Cybersecurity Agency, Singapore, CSA. Boris Hanstuk, Chief Information Security Officer, Tokopedia. Lee Dolson, Chief, Chief Architect, Asia Pacific for Z Z Zscaler. Gavin Loth, who is the Regional Director, Enterprise Sales, Asia Pacific in Japan, Secure ID and RSA Business. And of course, the session will be moderated by Andrew Milroy, who is a Principal Advisor at CIO Academy Asia. Would you please welcome our panel with a round of applause. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's great to be at a, at a live event like this. And I'd like to thank uh, Rama and David and the uh, CIO Academy Asia team for setting this up. It's just fantastic to see so many people in one place at the same time. And it's, it's also kind of nostalgic. I forgot quite how cold you can get in Singapore in these hotel rooms. It's, you know, it just reminds me of 2019 uh, and before. So one of the interesting things that came up a, a few times is how uh, COVID has obviously been the trigger and the driver for a lot of the dig digital transformation that's taken place. Uh, over the last couple of years. It's a great analogy, COVID, with cybersecurity. Uh, what's interesting is when we look at the approach that's been taken to COVID today, we're assuming that we can't eliminate it entirely, and we're building up layers of defense to manage the risk associated with the pandemic. Broadly, that is the direction that we're going in with cybersecurity. We're moving to a world where we are assuming breach. So we're assuming that we can't get rid of all of these breaches, but what we do is build up layers of defense to try to minimize the impact that those breaches have on us and our organizations. So it's a great analogy to use to switch and to, to help, I guess, a lot of people understand some aspects of, of cybersecurity. But what we've also seen over the last couple of years is a change in the way we've been working with technology. So people have been working remotely to a greater extent. There's been a rush to the cloud. We've talked about that. And sometimes cybersecurity has been something of, a, of an afterthought. And traditional means of protection have stayed in place, and a lot of organizations haven't switched their cybersecurity posture to address their current technology architectures. So perhaps just to start off, uh, Marari, perhaps if I could you know, just ask you about you know, the changing uh, approach to risk that you guys are taking. Uh, and if you could just tell us what are some of the major threats that you're seeing at the moment? How are you seeing that threat landscape changing? How do you expect it to change over the next year or so? And what kinds of changes do you think need to be made to your cybersecurity posture? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I think, I think in reality, the, some of the threats we saw pre-COVID, during COVID, and as we hopefully get out of COVID, you know, there's hope. Um, you know, some of it won't change. It's just that, you know, a lot of these threats become more amplified. Uh, and the reality is that a lot of organizations are still playing catch up. Um, and that will continue, right? Um, in terms of improving the maturity of what they have um, to, to keep up pace. But I think, you know, looking forward, some of the, some of the uh, sort of additional things uh, we need to consider uh, also due to some of the technology proliferation or technology landscape changing. A couple of things. So I think one is around uh, the emergence of 5G. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think currently there's about 70 countries worldwide which have 
uh, either deployed uh, 5G networks or, or 5G technology. Um, and you know, with 5G comes the promise of you know higher speeds, low latency, and you know a, a greater range of frequencies, which products or, or you know uh, technology which pro previously could not be connected will become connected. Right. So that itself will will sort of be a very new attack surface to consider uh, when when protecting uh, assets, and um, that is something I'm sure the threat actors will will look at as well to exploit. The, the second thing is really, I mean, machine learning. I mean, machine learning has been around, but I think as more and more organizations adopt that, and as we see more and more the humans are moved out of the knowledge loop, um, you know, there's an opportunity that also, uh, you know, um, uh, create havoc with modifying algorithms potentially for either for profit, for financial gain, or to cause disruption, right? You know, for example, if you go and modify algos around pricing models, what could that impact be, right? So that, that's one as well. Um, the, the other sort of things as well is around uh, cloud. I think cloud's been around, but I think as, as more and more organizations uh, shift workloads to cloud, the question is, you know, is there a lot of concentration risk? Should we go multi-cloud or, you know, uh, you know, choose two or three different providers? Similarly, as the major cloud providers compete or consolidate market share, suddenly they become an attractive target because if you want to call, cause wide-scale disruption, big scale, uh, you know, data compromise, you know, the cloud providers became a target, right? I think the last thing as well is really the, uh, it's not so much a threat horizon, but I think what, what I see more happening is really the um, reduce a uh, complexity reduction. Uh, and, and this is really due to product proliferation, right? And I think uh, if you look at the cybersecurity market now, I was reading that just in Hedge One this year, there's 11 and a half billion VC funding pumped into cybersecurity, right? So, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs out there, great, you know, hopefully they have ideas which will turn into solutions, which will solve problems. But I think the reality as a buyer of these capabilities, you know, it's not about, you know, we don't need a lot of products, we just need the right products. Um, so I think a, a lot of uh, decision makers within organizations will start looking at their ecosystem or their capabilities to see how they can further consolidate, rationalize, uh, because essentially what they want is the right products which deliver the right control efficacy and give you the good telemetry um, and also do a lot of automation and orchestration. So I think that's also uh, what, what I see happening, you know, complexity reduction as well. Thanks, thanks for those, those insights, Marari. So perhaps if I could ask a similar question to Boris. So obviously, you know, we've seen you know, a huge increase in the amount of uh, e-commerce activity going on uh, over the last 18 months or two years. What kinds of new threats have you seen emerging as a result of this, and, and how are you dealing with those threats? So it's, um, I think it's a different proposition in the context of e-commerce. And e-commerce, and you know, it's it's a technology company. We are designed to grow very very fast, and so an event like COVID you know, changes entire industries, but just is growth for us. So it doesn't change much the attack surface when we just you know, deploy a thousand more servers that are doing the same thing that the five th other thousand servers are already doing. Of course, we're continuing to, you know, to invest, to create new services, to, you know, to, uh, and I think in Indonesia, where, where my company is based, um, we have a tendency to have you know, giant super apps that do everything. Uh, probably because in Indonesia, you, you know, every big company has to create uh, you know, an entire ecosystem of services to, to be able to, to thrive. Um, but in the context of you know, what COVID changed, I think we were ready to actually absorb most of the changes. And, and some, you know, basically growing the number of customers is very easy. So the demand side is very easy. Growing the supply side is a challenge because um, we had like mom and pop shops did not receive all the traction. You know, uh, no one could visit them anymore. And so they had to you know, transform. How do, we, how, do we, how do these guys get up and sell on the web? And so these guys were, you know, uh, and you on flow at a speed that surprised us, I would, I would say. Uh, and it was about, you know, on, um, onboarding merchants fast enough and, and, and changing, you know, how commerce works uh, in Indonesia. And it's not replacing, uh, you know, the, the physical stores. It's really, you know, we're growing together. Uh, in terms of security, what we witnessed is not actually a change in the landscape of, you know, how uh, a new technology would create a problem for us. It's more about uh, our attackers have day jobs, and all of a sudden they're, they're doing the, most of their, most of them are 
are doing their day jobs at home. And so they have access to you know, better tools for attacking, but they don't have when they're at, you know, at their day job uh, because their network is better controlled, et cetera. And so they spend more time you know, with better tools attacking us. Uh, because it, it used to be only you know, at night for them uh, when they had some time or during the weekend, and now, oh, they had a full day, you know, I don't have a meeting right now, I'll try to attack the Copedia. And, and that we realize, you know, the, this changing the frequency uh, of attacks changes, um, because we are, you know, very, very large in, in Indonesia, 100 million uh, customers every month, we, and, and everyone you know, publishes his real name and real uh, physical address because you actually hope to receive your items. Uh, very often we're in a position where we can uh, find out you know, who is at the origin of the attack. And you find you know, software developers, we find uh, security researchers, we find, you know. so it's interesting, but in, in the end it's about the extra time that they have to you know, look for opportunities and attack attackers. Um, we kind of encourage every, every, every one of them to, oh, we have a, a bounty program, it's open. You know, please win some money rather than you know, trying to steal uh, $10, $10 dollars from here or there. Uh, and, and most of them do, but we see, you know, overall, uh, we see that uh, it, it was an impact. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Boris, those insights. Uh, so, Gareth, if I can move on to you, if perhaps if we can talk about uh, the changes that we're, we're going through from a national perspective. I know that you know, Singapore government organizations and agencies have come out with quite a lot of very useful guidelines. MAS is frequently coming out with new guidelines. The new TRM ones came out not too long ago. And you yourselves came out with the uh, cyber Singapore government cybersecurity strategy just a few weeks ago. So what, based on, on, on these guidelines and these publications, what do you think Singapore organizations need to do different now to protect themselves? So what are the changes they need to handle and how do they need to change their, their postures? It's a really big question. So let me try and break it down a little bit. Um, so firstly, I agree with everything that Murray and Boris just said. Uh, the threats are changing. They're changing in, in not just in the scale, the scope, the depth, the complexity, but just in the nature. Um, a year and a bit ago, if you'd asked me what the biggest threats we're facing, probably be sophisticated attackers, possibly nation state types. Today, ransomware is dominating the agenda of many of our conversations because the tools that they're using are just as sophisticated and there's this whole ecosystem behind them. This very lucrative Lamborghini driving ecosystem of sophisticated technologists who are supporting each other. They have help desk now for ransomware. If you don't know how to get a Bitcoin to pay off the ransomware, call a number 24 seven. They will teach you how to get a Bitcoin to pay them off. And I would argue that some of their customer services are better than some of the banks. That's how sophisticated it's become. In a year, they've changed in the texture of their attacks. So the threat's very different. At the same time, kind of, the first five years, we spent most of our time, energy, and effort thinking about how to protect our crown jewels, you know, the key critical information systems that drive and power the essential services of Singapore. And that was really our focus. But today, post-COVID, what's an essential service? I mean, is getting your food to your apartment if you're locked in an essential service? Yes, because otherwise you starve. You know, is, is getting internet to your apartment an essential service? Yes, because otherwise you're fired. What is an essential service is completely changed. And so one of the biggest shifts in our strategy is thinking about cybersecurity, not just in terms of protecting those crown jewels, but protecting the whole cyberspace. And that's a huge mission. It's a very different mission. And how do you do that? Um, I'll give two simple analogies. The first is water filtration. The sec second is condo security. And the second one deals more with cloud. But I'll talk about water filtration first. Uh, in the 1600s and 1700s, when kings and queens ruled Europe, uh, people would dig wells in their gardens. Water would come up. The kings and queens would make sure that they would have posters in every village say, please boil your water before you drink it. If there's a dead frog in the water, please don't drink it, you'll die. And people would regularly die of all sorts of disgusting diseases because they didn't boil their water. If you think about cybersecurity today, it's largely the same model. We put up posters telling people to use strong passwords and to use 2FA. And if you die of a strange malware and virus on your computer, you know, it's your fault. We told you not to do it. But then in the, 1900, in the 1800s, they had this revolutionary idea. Why don't we build pipes? 
we'll filter the water, put pipes through, and then you drink the water from the pipes. It may not taste great, it'll taste okay, but at least you won't die from it. And that's what we're trying to do now. So the whole idea behind creating a safer cyberspace is we'll filter the internet upstream so that you can get clean drinking water downstream. Does it mean it's going to taste like Evian? Does it, is it going to taste as good as the box on the table? Probably not. And so there'll be many people, companies in particular, who will want to invest more to make sure that it's not just tap water. It's clean, it's purified, you know, highly protected, safe drinking water for their employees or their company. That's perfectly fine. So there's a role for the government to provide a safe, secure utility to the people. There's also a role for the private sector to do more. And now I'll come to the condo one where we talk more about cloud. Cloud's another big shift. Uh, even two years ago, before COVID, cloud was a big deal. It was important. Today, cloud is integral. Every company is talking about how can I do more on the cloud? Not should I be on the cloud? That conversation was two years ago. The, the answer is yes, you should. But how? And if you think about how cybersecurity has been positioned traditionally, uh, my, in my previous life, I was actually a CIO in the Air Force. And most of my battles, 99.9% .9 of the times, were with the CISO of my organization. And I was constantly arguing with him and telling him that he was slow, he was holding me back, uh, he was not thinking fast enough, and I needed to do all these clever, innovative things. And he was telling me, no, I'm slowing you down to keep you safe. That model doesn't work anymore. Cybersecurity needs to catch up. And your CISO needs to be a part of the team. So what we've tried to do in the whole national shift is to try and make the developers and the security professionals work together as early on as possible so that by the time SingPass is on your phone, it's already secure. It's already built with everything that I want inside it so that later on you can make it your digital IC, you can make it your travel pass, you can do whatever you want with it because I trust the basic infrastructure. It's built securely. And now I talked to the, the, the last analogy about cloud and condo security guards. The cloud is a very unusual space. It's a shared space. It is a space where even the providers themselves, the cloud providers will tell you that actually it's a shared responsibility. I will do some part of protection, you do some part of protection. But the tenants don't fully understand that. And sometimes they think, well, I'm on the cloud, it should be safe, it should be secure. I mean, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, you know, Huawei, they're all big companies. They should protect me for me, because I'm paying you money, right? But they don't really understand the model. And so we try to use this idea of, of condo security. If you have a landed property, you have to do all the security yourself. You build the fences yourself, you build the doors yourself, you the windows, etc. It's all your job. You decide how many cameras you're going to put in. If you live in a condo, actually, the security guard downstairs does patrol. They do have a fence around it. There's a minimum level of security that the condo provides. But once somebody's inside the condo, it's your responsibility to secure apartment. You better have a lock on your door. You better make sure that if you have windows facing the common hallways, those windows are locked. So you have a responsibility to play to secure that part of the conversation. And even then, if you let a plumber into your apartment to fix the pipes, you better make sure the plumber doesn't have access to your master bedroom. If you have a helper who lives in your apartment, you better make sure your helper doesn't have access to your safe. And that's where this idea of kind of zero trust, assume breach, assume people are coming in and out of your house, in and out of your apartment, in and out of your condo, and just take layers of protection to make sure that you mitigate and manage the damage. So the whole idea of risk mitigation, risk management, thinking about already being breached is very important. Uh, so that's the big shift we've seen and the big shift we're moving towards. Thanks. Those are great analogies because I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in cybersecurity is communicating the issues we face in a kind of language that, that business leaders, non-technical people will understand is often thought of as a very technical area. So I think those kind of analogies are, are very important to get the message across. Um, so Lee, uh, you know, we've talked a few times about, about, about cloud and uh, you know, the, the rapid shift to the cloud. I know Michael was talking about it in court, uh, the digital transformation initiatives at Standard Chartered earlier today. Um, what kinds of new vulnerabilities are emerging as people rapidly move to the cloud? What, what new vulnerabilities are you seeing and what can be done to address those uh, challenges, those vulnerabilities? Yeah, um, I mean, 
a, a lot of what we see is, it, it's a, lot, a little bit what Michael alluded to too, it's when people are making the journey to the cloud, they're saying, well, this is what I built in the data center. Let me just build a virtual version of that in the cloud. And, but then you're just carrying all the problems of the data center with you into the cloud, you know, the, the user problems, the operations problems, the patching problems. So it is, um, you know, it is around shifting the strategy of how are you building the apps themselves and how are you building the security of those apps. But it's also recognizing that, uh, like um, Gaurav was saying, the, you know, the, the, the Amazons and the Microsofts and the Googles and Huawei's of the world, they're, their primary mission is to secure the condo, right? Like they're not trying to secure what you're running inside the condo. And uh, especially when you're going multi-cloud, even the tools, like the nature of the way the security guard works that you can hire in Microsoft is very different from the one that might work over in Amazon. And do you want to have to deal with managing the differences in those security guards or do you want to find systems that can actually be multi-cloud agnostic do you hire a third party security firm that can actually look across all these clouds, making sure you're having consistent levels of control? Uh, and then also, yeah, looking at that, you know, the, the lock analogy was something I was gonna, gonna talk about as well, because you know, you're looking at identity and you have to shift identity into the cloud. SingPass is great. I love that in Singapore. And I, I you know, Gaurav, it sounds like you're, you know, we're, we might see a world where a private enterprise can start to use SingPass, because I think that's, identity is really, really important uh, in this cloud world, and where does identity come from, and who's managing the identity? Uh, and so, you know, in a kind of a know your customer kind of environment, having the Singapore government know the identity of all of us here is great. Um, but that's just the, the, you know, if you think about that, there's two levels of the lock. There's the, there's the door to get into the condo, and then there's the door to the safe, or the door to your laundry room, or the door to whatever it might be. And typically what I see a lot of people doing is, um, you know, they're like, well, I'll just put my apps in the cloud and I'm gonna use the, the, the locks will be kind of exposed on the internet. You know, I'm just gonna do my identity one time. Uh, when, you, when you go to the application, I'm gonna check who you are. But why should the maid need to be able to see the lock on the safe, right? So if you're really doing zero trust, it's at two multiple tiers. It's, it's at the, can you even see the application level? Because this is when you deal with the nation state attackers and things. Um, they're checking where are the locks? Where are all the locks I can see from China or from Russia? If there's locks, you know, just because it's got SingPass on that lock doesn't mean I can't find a way to pick the lock. So start to use zero trust principles to hide the lock so that unless you're the actual Singapore citizen or employee or customer or the, the plumber, you can't even see the lock. And then once you see the lock, your ID is what un unlocks the app. So it's multiple tiers of zero trust as well. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think zero trust obviously is a super important uh, principle in the cybersecurity world. Just again, reinforcing that point of assuming breach and just making it as difficult as possible for attackers once they get inside your system and or networks. Uh, so, uh, you know, Gavin, perhaps if I can, I can ask you a question. Um, we talk a lot about all the controls that we need to put in place, but I think one of the things that holds organizations back is the friction that those controls might create. And it's very important to try to get a balance between, actually in the e-commerce world, that's an important one, a balance between uh, you know, the, the right level of, well, the right level of risk, basically, the right level of controls and usability. Uh, Part one of the question I'd like to ask you is how do you think that is that is best addressed? But part two of the question is just step back a bit. Tell us what's going on at RSA. I notice there's been quite a few structural changes there. You can answer in whatever sequence yes, you want. Yes, thanks, there. Andy. Let, let me answer that first. I think um, you know we've gone through a a lot of changes there. We, as most of you know, we were part of Dell for a, a long time, and about 18 months ago, um, STG which is a big private equity company, came in and purchased the, all the assets. And I think from their perspective, it was very good timing. You know, just, uh, just if you think about the identity kind of issue that we had and the accelerated digital transformation that happened over the last kind of 18 months. But uh, we completed that transaction in September last year and we're essentially running as a, as a separate privately run organization. And there's goods and bads with both of that, right? I mean, you know, we don't have the scale that, that essentially Dell brings to the market. 
But what is very good is the speed at which we can respond to customers and partners. And that's, that's been some very good feedback that we've received over the last kind of six months, you know, just being able to address the needs of customers and partners, um, you know, from a technology perspective. So, you know, just there's a lot of investment going on, especially in the, in the cloud space, uh, you know, kind of modernizing those technology features uh, with regards to the identity platform as well as our governance platform. So it's, it's, a, it's been a journey, I must say. You know, there's been a lot of changes within the organization. I'm only, I'm only five months in, which, is, uh, which, uh, which has been interesting, a, a rocky ride for me. But, you know, the technology is excellent. A lot of investment, as I said, has been going on. Um, excellent from a culture perspective. So it's really been a, a, you know, a good kind of journey for me. I think on the second piece is, you know, just to some earlier comment, you know, perimeters are disappearing, um, attack surfaces are, are broadening, and the pace at which digital transformations happened over the last 18 months has been amazing. I think a lot of organizations which typically take, and I've had some examples of this, which typically take maybe two years to do a project, were, you know, doing that same project in six weeks at the beginning of June or July last year. And, you know, a CISO's perspective would be, are we just making better decisions or are we doing shortcuts? And this is essentially kind of, I think, some of the, the things that are being thought about now is really, let's look back. You know, all of this accelerated pace that's happened over the last 80 months from a regulatory and compliance perspective, let's make sure we look back and make sure we haven't left any holes. And I think that's key. A lot of organizations are doing that because they've realized what's happened in the last 18 months with remote workforce and you know, secure workstations that are at home, you know, protected by a $60 outer, it's actually scary. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work and a lot of effort that's been put into that look back procedure now to make sure that uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is done correctly. And, and the other piece that is, is, you know, comes up quite often is the decisions that we made pre-COVID, you know, two or three years ago, especially around identity, are those still valid today? You know, because if you are protected behind a perimeter, it's a different level of, of risk that you're taking. And I think there's a lot of those conversations going on. Are the decisions and the technology implementations that we made you know, kind of 18 or 24 months ago, are they still valid today? Yeah, great. Th thanks for that, Gavin. I notice a, a question coming in. So, folks, if you have any questions you'd like to pose to the audience, please, please feel free to ask them. But one's come in here for you, Boris. Um, what does it mean to have a cloud-native cybersecurity architecture? I... Tokopedia is 12 years old. So it's a bit older than, than you know, what you might imagine. And that means that uh, at the beginning, um, some part of the infrastructure were actually not on the cloud. The, the full lift and shift has happened, you know, it's way in our past. Um, I would say when you're fully native, you know, no, we would say, you know, fully on the cloud, you abandon entire classes of problems. You really need an active directory. You know, that's you know, everyone, every bank has an active directory. When you're fully on the cloud, you, you actually wonder. You actually, you know, you, you have an option not to take this road. So yeah, it removes all, you know, all authentication for Windows, but then you know, plenty of vendors will, will, will help you on that. I would say overall, the challenge that we see is uh, the, the small differences that we see from one cloud to the other. Um, we chose, uh, the infrastructure is split on many different cloud providers, and it's a challenge to get to secure, I would say, one cloud. Now, when you get to actually try and secure three, that's a, that's a new class of challenge. You, know? and you cannot really hope to, to hire people that would be very, very good at three different clouds. So you have to re resort to vendors that will help you, you know, get a broad coverage, and then zoom in when you see a, when you see a problem. Overall, um, we have seen during COVID, you know, being fully on the cloud helps us 
process in terms of infrastructure. It helps us in security. It's much faster to deploy new controls. Uh, we deployed a, a new vendor. I will not cite the vendor, I guess, but um, on, on three different clouds, something about cloud maturity. Uh, when I reached out to you know um, their, their previous clients, they told me, oh, it's about you know one month to deploy per cloud. You know when you when you take everything uh, everything uh, all together. At Tokopedia, we took five days to deploy on everything. Why? Because I would say, because we're on three different clouds, we we take care about you know automating a lot of stuff, about uh, simplifying a lot of stuff. Um, you know, it's relatively comfortable, but it's difficult to hire. Could I add uh, two points to what Boris mentioned about cloud native security? In my mind, there are kind of three big things that are fundamentally different from cloud security versus kind of legacy architecture on-prem. First one is identity, which you mentioned already. The second one is perimeters. In a legacy architecture system, we tend to define perimeters by offices. Uh, this is, you know, uh, the Tanjong Paga office perimeter. It's a geographical based. In a cloud naked native architecture, geography is almost irrelevant. It's more team based. It, there's a conceptual architecture behind the perimeter rather than a geographical one. Uh, the third one is dependencies, and I don't quite know how to explain it. But once you're fully cloud native, actually, you lose a little bit of control over your stack. You end up depending on systems to connect with other systems in ways that are not entirely predictable. And that challenge of managing that interconnectivity uh, actually is quite complex to just map out. In, the, in a previous world, if I ask you to know your assets, you can actually list down all of the computers and all the software licenses that you bought. In a cloud native world, I mean, I don't know if you know what software you're running. I, it's a very difficult. So that's a huge challenge that's, that's still difficult. And honestly, even the cloud service providers themselves don't know their own stacks because the stacks go really deep down to open source libraries that they don't even know that they're using to, to build stuff. So things get more complex. But there are huge advantages to being cloud native if you can unlock the legacy models that you have about identity, about perimeters, and stuff like that. Great. Thanks, Gaurav. I think another important uh, issue to talk about was uh, I know it was discussed in the presentation that preceded, uh, preceded this panel, the Proofpoint presentation. Um, there was the, 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 the focus was on some of the issues around the human aspect of cybersecurity and the fact that humans are effectively starting to become uh, a link that attackers are going for, the weakest link. Uh, attackers are finding, you know, vishing and phishing uh, being much more successful than, you know, we might have expected a few years ago. The fact that's still going on and, what is it, 75, 80% of attacks start with, you know, fish, vishing or phishing. They're a kind of way in and to, uh, you know, before the, the bigger attacks kind of kick in. So, Merari, um, you know, I know that, you know, we've talked about this this before and I know you have some views on this issue, but... You know, how is this changing posture? How is this that basically the the mix of humans being seen as the weakest link and, and being, I guess, ruthlessly exploited by attackers uh, and the, the lack of talent uh, causing challenges? And how are you addressing this? Yeah, I think I think it's twofold, right? I think the, the traditional approach has been the human factor has focused a lot on employees and seeing what we can do to improve security culture. But I think more and more, especially for banks, you know, the other human factor is customers. Uh, because the reality is, especially over the last 12 to 18 months, the, it, there's been a phenomenal increase in, in uh, fraudsters, scammers, you know, targeting a lot of the customers. And, and the reality is, you know, we, we can only protect so much, right? You know, we protect our environment. And during COVID, as, as more and more features were pushed onto the banking apps, we can protect the apps but we don't control the device. We don't control the behaviors of the customers. You know, we don't control where they buy their phone, whether it's a jailbroken phone, for example. But you know, it's almost a, a corporate responsibility that we have to continuously educate our customers as well around the risks, right? Um, and, and really, from a, from a customer angle, it's, it's also not a one-size-fits-all approach, right? Um, we have some demographic of customers who still like going to the branch as it starts to open up, right? So, you know, just pushing messages, say, for example, on internet banking or, you know, in-app notifications is not enough, right? We've got different types of customers, right? Some go to the ATM. So we've got to think differently on where we can position our messaging and awareness and continuously educate them. So I think customers is now a, a big part of, I think, a lot of financial institutions' um, uh, education awareness program to sort of educate, right? That's beyond our, our control in that sense, but it's, it's almost a corporate responsibility. On the employee front, um, 
I think gone are the days where we can just rely on, on the posters and, and, and emails going out. I think, I think everybody's just fatigued and probably you know, create rules on the mailbox that something coming from these guys will, will put in a folder, right? And we've got to almost think of creative ways of how we, we educate and make people more aware. Um, yes, you know, I think the, the, the phishing simulations, testing people's susceptibility, that's still important. But I think we need to slowly move away from, you know, um, a, a compliance view of education, right? Where, where normally uh, bad security behavior is penalized, but there's not enough of incentivizing good behavior, right? Because that's how you bring people on board uh, as part of the security journey, is you also promote good practices and recognize people who are actually making the effort uh, to, to, to do things securely. Right? So I think more incentivization, gamification. But even from a corporate standpoint, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Right? Because uh, defend, de depending on the, the, the demographic of, of, the, of the business or the organization, there's different things you need to educate different people on. There's, there's obviously the board or the exec level. I mean, uh, then you, know, you, you can't go and talk to the board, for example, on secure coding practices. That's not going to work. That, that's more for your development community where you, know, you, you can, and there's a lot of you know, uh, tools out there nowadays which will gamify the whole coding experience. Um, so there's also you know, various tailored, uh, you know, targeted awareness, uh, which, which also needs to be designed. I think the general awareness, that's foundational, but, but that's not enough. Great, thanks, Murray. I saw another question a bit earlier relating to, to data privacy, uh, and, and I think this applies to perhaps you, Murray. I might throw it throw it at you because I know it, it, it's relevant to everybody. But you know, as a as a as a uh, you know financial services a bank, it's it's particularly important. But how are you addressing these kind of evolving, changing, and actually very very strict data privacy regulations? Yeah, I, th I think I saw the question around uh, the challenges as well, right? I think the, the important thing is to identify, in the context of, for example, the PDPA, where this information resides, right? Um, especially from a system standpoint, that's very important to do because, you know, the first thing you should then challenge the organization or challenge system owners on why you have that data on your system, you know? And I think understanding where that data resides and how it flows will then allow you to then put the right protection in place because you can't secure everything, right? And, and I've heard and I've, and, I've, and I've seen organizations who actually, as a result of doing this exercise, were able to also streamline a lot of business process because people started to challenge, why does this business process need to consume that data? Is there a better way of doing it? So I then identifying where the data is first and then having a sort of a rules-based approach on classifying the information based on its sensitivity. Because depending on the level of classification of the information, you apply the right controls, right? Um, and then I think the important thing, I think especially now, a lot of focus on data leakage is, you know, what controls you have in place to ensure that, um, you know, the, 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 the data doesn't leave the organization or it goes to the intended party in that sense. Great. Thanks for that, Murari. There's another issue that comes up uh, comes up quite a lot with uh, organisations that, that we speak to, and that's just getting visibility across all of your assets and visibility of the threats. And this is particularly acute in multi-cloud environments. And I think, as you indicated, Murari, people are very reluctant to stick with one provider. And again, it's a it's a balance risk management kind of issue. But but Lee, can you speak to that? How how can organisations get better uh, visibility across across multiple clouds? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple angles to that. Like, um, you know, Graf touched on this. You know, there's the, the visibility if you're investing in multiple clouds on what are the, you know, what are the controls, what are the implementations? And that's, that is things that, you know, cloud vendors, I'd say this is still in a lot of ways in its infancy, you know, building monitoring of that in each cloud, but you get back to the same problem I mentioned earlier, where, you know, you're, then you've got to learn how the, how the security system works in each one versus one that goes across. So there's auditing, you know, what's deployed in the cloud, what are the controls, what are the, you know, what are the permissions? So auditing, not just configuration, but auditing permissions. But then there's also the auditing of uh, access. And so if you are starting to, to bring zero trust into this, you can audit, you know, you start to look at all the endpoints if you can build zero trust through, uh, throughout everywhere. And that takes, it's a journey. It's often really easy to start with the users Actually, it's really easy to do zero trust with the users, start to audit that. But you know, we're, more and more, we're looking at and working with people, how do I bring that to the devices? 
to workloads. And if I can start to use zero trust principles all the time, you start to get that audit coming out naturally. And then the, you know, the last frontier is, okay, let's pull the cloud, like Michael Gorris was talking again, can we pull the same kinds of things I'm doing in the cloud, but pull that back into the old world? Because the data center isn't gonna go away for the majority of organizations. It's gonna get smaller, but it's gonna be around for a long time. So I still wanna take these new things we're learning in the cloud and I wanna pull them in. I wanna pull the cloud into the data center to allow that same kind of inventorying and control from that perspective as well. Thank, thanks for that, Lee. I notice a few uh, other questions coming in. So Gavin, do you mind if I uh, ask you one of these? I mean, do you have a view on the, what organizations can do to increase intelligence sharing? I guess there's a situation we have today where you know, some companies face a threat, you know, they might have a ransomware attack, and it might be something they keep quiet and nobody else knows about, and the same thing happens to multiple organizations. So. You know, what other ways organizations can increase this level of sharing and, and develop uh, so-called joint cyber defense capabilities that, that you, you're familiar with? I mean, I think um, as a security community, I think over the last 18 or 24 months, we have got a lot better. I think there is a lot more information sharing. People are realizing kind of nation state actors or large digital threats, ransomware is most probably the most prevalent and, and phishing as well. These come into the fore very, very quickly. Uh, and I think we've just, as a, as a community, as an organization, uh, organize, uh, companies and employees have just become much better at sharing across that. And I think it's, it's a little bit like social media. I mean, I think the, the bad stuff runs out quickly. Um, and I think people are much more reactive to that. But I also think, you know, COVID's been a catalyst. We've had the infrastructure in place to do a lot of this remote um, kind of workforce kind of planning and um, remote kind of working for a long time. COVID essentially has just been the catalyst for this, um, you know, remote workforce and, and kind, of, um, kind of employees. And essentially what happened is People have gotten very used to it very quickly and have kind of some of these rules have, have laxed out a little bit and people are just becoming, you know, if you sit in front of Zoom for, you know, eight hours, it becomes a problem and you become kind of uh, a little bit kind of less averse to the risk. So I think generally speaking, I think people are just getting better at it, uh, you know, from a, from a security community perspective. Great. Thanks, Gavin. There's another question, um, and I think it relates to some of the work that you are doing, Boris, but the question, cybersecurity is often feared uh, as a stick. Is it possible to make a, a carrot uh, for the business? So I know you, you've, you've read team exercises and bug bounties and, and, and so on. So can you tell us a bit about what you do there to, I guess, to make it, to gamify it we make to it an fun. extent and to make it less of a threat? Make it fun. Yeah, make it fun. Yeah. We make it fun. Honestly, um, we make it fun and we pay for it. So internally, you know, people are rewarded when they bring you know, better security. Externally, we reach out to researchers saying, you know, please, hackers, please tell us. You're doing extremely good efforts. You know, every website on the, for, from the Singapore government has at the bottom of the page, if you find a security vulnerability, please, you know, get some money. Click here, describe it to us, you'll get some money. Private companies do the same, um, sometimes privately, sometimes they talk about it, sometimes not. Uh, we are clearly open, you know, we do it ourselves. Some, some companies, uh, uh, some platforms are, are really good at, uh, at uh, you know, bringing this bug bounty situation into something that is positive for everyone. Uh, to me, one thing that we do not talk much about, everyone talks about pen test. Everyone, you know, heard, has heard a little bit about Red Team and confuses the two. And to me, it's, it's a dramatic situation. When you approach a vendor, they will tell you, oh, we can sell you pen test, or we can tell you, sell you a red team exercise. And if you do the terrible mistake of buying the two together, like a package, you buy red team and a pen test, you get a pen test. So a pen test is scanning very wide, but very shallow. A red team is like, oh, we don't care about how many, you know, how many endpoints you have. We found one vulnerability, we jump from this host to the second host, we get a, a reliable way to uh, improve our privileges, and we ended up with the password of the CEO of the company, or an access to the database and to, to be able to extract the, the client data. Overall, a red team exercise is an opportunity to challenge your assumptions. 
You have bought the best uh, email protection on, uh, on the planet. Proofpoint is here, I think. Uh, well, challenge it now. You know? Send fake email and try to bypass. And honestly, I've seen you know, companies invest in the hundreds of millions per year in security, uh, fail at assumptions that were clearly, you know, we, we, I remember <laughs> still today, the meeting where we were organizing the, the Red Team exercise. We had a list of scenarios, and so we had some extreme pushback saying, you know, it's impossible to bypass this control. Don't waste your time. Don't, you know, uh, a Red Team exercise is, is a costly exercise. You know, please don't waste our, our budget on this one. You do it, and you destroy the assumptions. To FA, it doesn't always work, or to FA can be bypassed. Um, it's impressive how good red teaming can give an opportunity to challenge what you think about your own security. I want to add a 30 second extension to that, but it's a slightly different point than red teaming. Cybersecurity is not just a stick, it's not just a carrot. I think it's actually the next bound of opportunity. Today, companies see cybersecurity as a compliance mechanism, like how do I check all of the lists, you know, get myself out of the trouble from the auditors. They're starting to move, and many of the smarter companies are starting to see cybersecurity as an enabler. If I do cybersecurity well, I can do more in the digital world. I think the next bound of real thriving companies will see cybersecurity as an opportunity, as a business differentiator. And if you think about the kind of the award that we just got for the cybersecurity labeling scheme, basically what we're doing is we're putting a sticker on the front of an IoT device and saying this is a four-star IoT device. You should pay more as a customer for this device than the guys who only got one star. Uh, I just got a new iPhone, and when I went to the iPhone shop, the Apple shop, it said iPhone privacy inside. It didn't tell me about the camera megapixels or any, how much storage was on the phone. iPhone privacy inside. Security is a selling point. So I think it's not just a carrot. It is now going to be the profit driver for most companies. And if you look at the cloud that you're evaluating in your company, you're looking at the cloud to see which is the most secure. You don't care about how much storage they have or how many data centers they have. You want to know which is the most secure one for your company. So security is going to be a selling point for the cloud and for your company in future. Very, very well put. Um, it's a very good point. It is going to be a, a key differentiator to cybersecurity. It already is, but it'll be it'll, it'll be just more blatant as as we move forward. So, I think we've 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 touched on some some very important and key points. I think it's been a great conversation. Uh, you know, I think the conversation around going cloud native, shifting left. Uh, you know, uh, sec, dev, DevSecOps is a very important one. Important one to have. Organisations are increasingly working towards doing that, but it's easier said than done with all the legacy that we've got. But I think what's come up a few times is, from an identity and access management perspective, I think there's still a lot of vulnerabilities out there. Faking identities is still too easy. Humans are still the weakest link. Uh, you know, we still have big issues around education and awareness to handle moving forward, and the threats are only increasing on a daily basis. Um, so I'd just like to, to thank uh, you know, Marari, Mar uh, Garav, Boris, uh, Lee, and Gavin for you know, a great conversation. Thank you guys for, for your, your comments and your insights. I think it's been a, a fantastic discussion. So thank you very much, folks, and have a great day ahead. Thank you very much. We invite the panel to take the leave from the stage. Perhaps to another round of applause. Why not? Yeah, there you go.